Well, thanks so much for having me. Uh, this is my first time to Tabletop Network, and it's great to see so many familiar faces and so many new faces as well. Um, I mentioned, uh, you know, the projector is trying to wake up. I'm trying to wake up, and I thought we might uh, wake up together by playing a game together. Are you up for a game? Yeah. All right. All right. So, uh, the game we're going to be playing together is called. Uh, it's it's going to be called an emotional eye test. Okay, so I see a lot of you have glasses on. That's good. You'll kind of know what's going on. We're going to take this big device up here. We're going to put it up against your head, and you're going to have to make snap decisions. Okay, we're going to make decisions like, do you like this, or is that better? <laughs> All right? You like that one, or that one? Except instead of uh, uh, you know letters, we're going to. I'm going to be showing you. Well, first I'm going to put you in a situation. Um, you're going to be playing a certain game. And then I'm going to show you two faces, uh, and the faces are going to represent your emotional reaction to the situation you're in. Okay? It'll become more clear as we play along. So here's the first situation. You're playing Monopoly. Now, don't make your faces yet. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so you've been playing Monopoly for maybe about 12 rounds, and you're up maybe, I don't know, like $517 or 200 something, or maybe you're down a little bit. You're not really sure what you're... Which you're, uh, where you're at, right? And you land on income tax. So I, I know all of you play Monopoly by the rules, right, by the book. So you know that you need to add up your entire net worth at this point. You need to add up all your cash, uh, the face value of all your properties, uh, unless they're mortgaged, then it's half, and then you add up uh, the, the value of all your houses. And you add all that up, you divide it by 10, and you round up. So, number one, <laughs> or number two? One or two? How many people say one? All right. Actually, why don't you clap so, so people can hear? All right. And number two? Okay. So it turns out that the, the faces that you make uh, in response to the emotions that you're feeling are pretty universal. Um, it used to be thought that this is a cultural convention that, that the emotional reactions you had to certain situations were learned. Like you learn them from your parents. But no, they're, they're pretty, much, pretty universal across cultures. And this was discovered uh, fairly recently, a uh, number of research done. The faces that these uh, uh, emotions are associated with are upset, unhappy, miserable, and perplexed, or slight or highly controlled fear. So I'm guessing that the people who said number two have a certain amount of math anxiety, maybe. But the rest of us are, are really in that kind of like kind of upset thing. I mean, you're basically asked to, you know, calculate your entire net worth, divide by 10, and round up for a friggin' monopoly space? You know what it gives. So that was my guess for what you would react there. Okay. So this is situation number two. This one's a little bit more nuanced, so I want you to think about it a little bit more. So you're playing Catan. You're losing really bad. All right. You're, you're trailing the leader quite a bit. And uh, the current player has just rolled a seven. So if you know Catan, they're going to take that robber, they're going to pick it up, and they're going to put it somewhere. So... Um, Current player rolls a seven, picks up the robber, and puts it right on your stone supply. And you're, you're trailing now. So number one? <laughs> or number two? Number one? Number two. How many for number one? All right. And number two? Oh, okay. You got much, much more in tune with this than my family. They, they totally lost that one. So this is, this is masked anger? Or uh, worry, apprehension, or controlled fear. And my guess was the masked anger there. So I'm, 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 I'm winning right now. All right. That, the last one, you're playing Pandemic. Yay! Yeah. Oh, that's nice. That's so nice. You're all about to win. You've got three cures in the bank. You've got five cards for that cure. And you're going you're gonna to win it in the next game. The only problem is you have to infect the world. And uh, there is a two in three chance that you're going to draw a red card and the world looks like that. So, number one or number two? <laughs> one, number two. How many for one? And number two? Yeah, all right. Yeah. If you pick number one, you are definitely going to lose that game. <laughs> so really like that. You're looking a little, a little too smug there. All right. So um, the faces uh, from this uh, uh, thing that I cobbled together here actually come from this book, Emotions Revealed. And you're probably asking yourself, what does this have to do with game design? 
Um, well, in, in this talk, I'm going to be talking about um, <clears throat> the importance of emotion in game design. I'm going to be talking about empathy. And I'm going to leave you with a tool that you can use um, in your day-to-day -day, uh, work uh, that can help you better unlock emotion and better understand the emotions that your players are uh, having as, as they're playing your game. Uh, before I jump into all that, though, um, I want to tell you a couple stories, uh, kind of to set some context. So the, the first story is really about how I got started, or the first game I ever got, I guess, I guess you could say got published. Um, so like many of you, I, I tinkered with games as I was a kid, and uh, my dream was always to get one game published. And I worked on one uh, shortly after I graduated high school in college, um, and I worked on it for like 10 years. Um, and so I want you to picture, it's the year 2000, Sunnyvale, California. Um, I'm sitting in my apartment with my then fiance, Donna, and we're both watching the Olympics, and we're both armed with uh, toenail clippers, okay? And we're going clip, 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 all day long. We're clipping the flange off of uh, these plastic bingo winks that I ordered. <laughs> from New York, we were like 10,000 of them, and they're all gonna go into my new board game, Lunatic's Loop, that I was gonna uh, release that year. And uh, the flange was really nasty, there was no way I was gonna put these really crappy looking chips into my game, so we had to just clip tons of them. Um, so the plan was to bring this game uh, to Spiel uh, in, in Germany, in Essen. I painted the board, this is uh, the board in acrylic, uh, hand painted, my friend Glenn did the, the cover of the game. Um, and here it is in uh, Hall 9 of the Mesa in, in Essen. Uh, it's a pretty, um, pretty simple affair. Uh, this is me collating the game on my bed in uh, Essen. Um, and actually built all the boxes there. They're really crappy boxes, kind of like the U-folded uh, variety, a couple steps up from like a Kinko's uh, box that you might get some paper in. Um, but we had a booth there. This is my, uh, my friend uh, Rick is in the bottom left there and I shared the booth. Uh, you could get away with a lot more back then. Um, and we saw this guy there as well. This is a young Knizia. Uh, he was um, showing off Lord of the Rings that year. So I bring this up not to talk about just humble beginnings, but I want to talk a little bit about the process that I used for, for designing this game, um, which can best be summarized by this photo, which is basically me wandering in the desert for 10 years, right? I, I, had, I really didn't know what I was doing, and my process was basically, I, would, I, I took a bunch of mechanisms from games that I, I liked. I took um, uh, blind action selection from Adelverplichtet, the old Toyberg game. I took uh, the board from Daytona 500. I lifted a bunch of rules from Circus Imperium. And I kind of threw it in a pot, and I stirred it up, and I showed it to people, and we played it. And then I'd ask them, hey, so did you, did you have a good time? You know, what did you think? Did, did, you, did you like that? Do you have any ideas for how I could make it better? And then I would take those ideas and I would throw them in, I would iterate on the prototype, and then we'd play it, and I would be like, hey, so how was that? Did you like that? Um, do you have any ideas? You know, what should I change? And I did that on and on uh, for like 10 years. And I pretty much stopped because, remember that board I painted in acrylic? I didn't want to change that. That was, uh, that was done, and I was pretty fed up with clipping bingo chips. So um, at that point, um, I kept, called it a day. I had a mediocre, fairly mediocre game and moved on. So time passes. This is about uh, three or four years later. I'm married now. Oh, by the way, we were, we were, we were clipping those bingo chips um, in preparation for Spiel at the same time we were preparing for the wedding. And uh, the game was much more work <laughs> than the wedding. Anyway, uh, <laughs> so I'm married now, miraculously. Uh, <laughs> and uh, I'm out. Um, uh, we got a house now. I've got my daughter, Colleen, who's uh, maybe about a year old. And I'm out giving her a walk. And I'm kind of in a new dad fog. And I'm thinking about board games, because like many of you, that's what we do. And um, I have this idea for maybe doing a co-op game. I had uh, played Knizia's Lord of the Rings, which I had seen at 2000 at, at that other spiel. And I thought, oh, it'd be fun to, to design one of those. I had no idea those could be as much fun as they were. Um, and I enjoyed playing with my wife. We always had a good time. So uh, I, I came home, and I, I started sketching this. This is the first pandemic board. Um, and I was just goofing around with some Sharpies and newsprint and um, uh, just a regular deck of uh, poker cards. So you can see that there's like queen and jack marked on there. And I was just goofing around trying to figure out if I could model um, a game about spreading disease. And I came to this point where I had to figure out what to do with the discard pile. And on a whim, I just threw it on top of the draw pile and started playing again. 
And I noticed something. Uh, my heart kind of skipped a beat because I could see that as I drew from the top of the drop pile, certain areas of the board would get uh, more infected, and I was kind of hooked. I, I could see how different areas of the board could be more intensified and how this could create all sorts of tension. And that, that emotional hook, that emotional core, is what kind of drew me into continuing on this design for the next three years, and then another year of development. So this one didn't take 10 years, it took three, but I started with this, this uh, emotional core. And, um, well, we know how that uh, <laughs> led. So Pandemic came out, it just got all these expansions and standalones. I was able to do a Pandemic Legacy series with uh, Mr. Rob Davio out there. Uh, we got the anniversary edition, a dice game. And our, uh, my presence at Spiel was a little less modest. Uh, we had the big Jumbotron a couple of years ago, which is really great. This is a complete surprise to me, by the way. I walked in and saw that. It was amazing. Um, so this is now I, how I start. Uh, I try to find an emotional core to my games and move outward from there. Um, so you can kind of see it here. And everything that I try to add to the game is really to try and reinforce that, that center. So it turns out, if you want to be effective at this, there's one skill that's really um, handy above all others, and that is uh, this one. It's, um, um, where is it? Missing a slide. It's empathy. I don't know where the slide is. Okay, so it's empathy. Empathy, empathy is important. <laughs> you want empathy. <laughs> anyway, um, it, it's like this famous quote. Um, we're going to watch this again. It's like this famous quote. Um, they may forget your mechanics, but they'll never forget the way that you made them feel, right? You've all heard that quote? Uh, right, yeah. So uh, I now consider that like the single most important part of a game is just basically the, what, the emotional journey that a player has. So this is all well and good, but how do, you, um, how do you get started with this? This leads to another quote. Um, I'm sure you've probably heard this, this quote a bunch. <laughs> This is up there, uh, this is in the, in the Hall of Fame of the interview questions that you get, like, what's your favorite game, and uh, of all the games out there, which do you wish you had designed, which I never know what to answer with. But I think there's something really important behind this, which is really, yeah, um, where do you start, right? I, I think this is a false dichotomy, but people always want to know where to begin. So I want to ask you all, because um, I, I don't know this crowd real well, uh, how many of you are familiar with the MDA framework, just show of hands? Okay, so some of you. I, I had never heard of this uh, until like three years ago. So it's been around for a while. It's, uh, I think it came out like 15 years ago at a, a game conference, or a conference about games. Um, and the MDA stands for uh, Mechanics, Dynamics, and um, Aesthetics. And the designers were basically looking at, or the presenters were looking at the, the way players experience games and the way designers design games. And their, their primary assertion was that, as game designers, we should be trying to create uh, an aesthetic experience. And when they say that, they're not saying uh, what the game looks like. They're really talking about the emotional reaction of a game. And their point was that you can't just generate that. It just doesn't just show up on the scene, right? You need to create some dynamics that uh, generate that. And the dynamics are basically changes. So interactions, interactions between the players or with each other, or interactions with the players in the system. But you can't just have those changes. They don't, they don't arrive. You need mechanics to do that. So this is kind of a long-winded framework of saying, hey, look, it's OK to pick, just start with mechanics, but do so always with that, um, the emotional impact in mind at the very end of the game. And there you go. That's what you need. You need that empathy, right? You need that empathy to figure it out. It turns out empathy breaks down into two different categories, or at least two. Uh, one is cognitive empathy, which is what uh, we did at the very beginning of the talk, we went through an exercise of cognitive empathy. We put ourselves in the shoes of someone in a game experience, right? Or any experience, and we tried to imagine from their point of view how they would be feeling. So that's cognitive empathy. You're trying to picture yourself. The second one is affective empathy, and this is where you're actually feeling what the other people are feeling yourself. So it turns out there's mirror neurons in your head that will actually fire. If you're, if you're watching someone going through something, you may actually begin to experience that yourself. There's a problem, though. This is a pretty common quote. I mean, I've been guilty of saying this myself. Uh, many of us say, hey, you know what? I design games for myself. And the problem is where you stop there. You're only designing for your own self. Um, you're leaving out you know, the rest of the world. And this is related to another uh, problem that I've been seeing, which is um, uh, best summarized from this. There's a research uh, experiment done 
I think it began like 40 years ago. Uh, yeah, it was in 1979, 2009, at the Univers University of Michigan. So they were, they were studying empathy in people, and they found that there were dramatic drops, like, like really big drops, drops of 40%, with the biggest drops over the last 10 years. And this was 10 years ago, so you can only imagine <laughs> where people have gone over the last 10. And the researchers also pointed to this epidemic of narcissism that was happening. So I'm not here to say that you're, you're accused of all of being narcissists or anything like that, but I, I do think this is something we need to be aware of and push back on. The results uh, from this are pretty, uh, pretty awful. Uh, the first one is poor representation. Um, so uh, I think it's great that the, the, um, the actions that this, this community is taking to, to try to work on this. Uh, the, the problem is when you're only designing for yourself and not looking outside yourself, you're less likely to re represent people who are not like you, right? Um, this slide I thought best, uh, <laughs> best summarized it. I see you laughing, Elizabeth. Um, so <laughs> this is a study posted to Cardboard Republic. It looked at the top 20 games from 2009 to 2016. They looked at the game covers. Turns out there are 50% more sheep than women on those game covers. I mean, that's shocking. That's really awful. Um, so, uh, Nikki Valens is actually going to be talking a little bit more about representation. I'm, gonna, I'm not going to go uh, into a ton of depth here. I just want to talk about some of the, the bad side effects. Uh, another is port accessibility. Um, I'm getting older now. My eyes aren't as young as they used to be. Um, you know, if you've got young eyes and you've got access to the full color spectrum, great. But there's a lot of other people who are colorblind. Um, there's people who can't read five-point type across the table. And people whose brains work differently than yours. So, you need to include other folks. Poor game balance is another one. So um, if you only test your game within your local community, groupthink uh, sets in. You're going to find other people outside your, your group that play the game totally differently and may break it. And the last one, um, we've got this uh, over-reliance, in my opinion, on, on many, and I'm guilty of this myself, on tire themes and, and tropes um, that we kind of turn to. Uh, and I think this is sort of a side effect of a uh, lowest common denominator. You know, if you're not testing on other people and you're just trying to guess what other people like, you're more um, apt to just kind of uh, uh, turn to, like, generic fantasy or that sort of thing. And Elizabeth Hargrave is going to be talking, I think, a little bit about this later. Uh, yeah, great. So this is how I now approach it. I, I try to design things from the inside out, which is basically I try to start with myself and, and the emotions that I feel, but then very quickly try to move outward from that, right? And this takes various forms. So uh, one form is, um, uh, one, one approach, designing from the inside out, is, is when you're playtesting, um, try to start with yourself. I mean, in many cases, you are the game. You don't even know what the game is. You begin and you're, you're just fooling around, like I was with that, that pandemic um, game. I, I didn't know what I was trying to do. I was just goofing off. So I had to start with myself, but then I involved colleagues, uh, friends, friends of friends, and then strangers over time. Uh, second, uh, look at the experience level of your testers. So um, I generally try to start with my target market, you know, people that I think are going to love the game most, but then gradually walk outward from there. So I tested uh, Pandemic with lots of people who are not gamers at all, uh, family, but also coworkers who didn't identify as, as a hobbyist at all. And last, um, your involvement should change. As I mentioned before, you're running that game initially. Uh, you are the game. Then you're playing it, and then over time, you're, you're maybe you're teaching it, and, but then you step back and you watch. Then you, maybe you're watching, but you're not answering any questions. You're still in the room. And finally, you know, you're not in the room at all. You remove yourself completely from that. But that leads to this problem of, okay, so you, you told me that you know, I should be empathetic. Well, how am, I, how am I supposed to be empathetic? How am I supposed to really engage with players' emotions if I'm not in the room at all? I mean, how does that work? And so um, to answer that, I want to share with you a method that I've been working on or using for the last uh, six years or so. Uh, here's, the, here's the question, right? Um, and that's remote playtesting with video. Uh, so this is a method that I started using about six years ago with uh, Pandemic the Cure. It was back in 2013 or so. Um, and it's, it comes out of my experience in, in high tech. So I, I used to work at um, uh, a lot of dinosaur in internet companies like AOL and Netscape and Yahoo. And I also worked at a startup. And I got to, to learn a lot of uh, design techniques from the design researchers and designers there. So I cobbled together this technique out of a couple. Uh, one, one was actually using uh, remote usability testing. So usertesting.com is just one of many uh, 
sites that use this, uh, that allow you to do this uh, thing where basically you recruit people uh, to test your software and uh, they go online and you can see their, their cursor moving around on the screen and uh, it's got like a heat map and you can watch them complete activities that uh, you, you put in front of them and then you see their face as well and you hear them kind of thinking aloud and going through their tasks. So you get their face and you get to see their, their cursor move around and see how they, uh, how they perform. The other is uh, uh, contextual design, uh, which was popular right around, uh, I want to say the turn of the century. In the early 2000s, this became um, a pretty common method in UX. So in this method, you would actually go to people's homes or places of work. So I know I have colleagues who worked for at eBay and would follow people home. I mean, with their consent, of course. They would, uh, <laughs> they would, they would, they would go and, and watch them like power sellers. They would watch them um, sell stuff in the context of, of, of their house so they could get all these environmental factors. Uh, or people working at Intuit, for example, uh, watching um, people use uh, TurboTax or like uh, QuickBooks, right? Um, because you learn a lot about the person using the software uh, by understanding uh, their context. So I took those two different ideas, um, remote usability testing and contextual design, uh, put those together and applied them to play testing. And this is the process in a nutshell. Basically, I recruit people, um, then ship them a game or a prototype. They then get it in the mail and uh, open it up and play it and record themselves playing it. Uh, then they upload that video. Um, I, uh, we, we watch the video and take notes. And then based on those notes, uh, iterate on the design. So I'm going to go into that in a little bit more detail. So the first step is recruiting. And this just sort of, you know, it, if you're doing this, this uh, method, I'd encourage you to use that inside out model. Um, generally, I, I start with a group of trusted play testers because sometimes the early prototypes are a little bit rocky. Uh, and then gradually work out to friends or friends of friends. And then finally, sending stuff out to strangers. And then likewise, um, I try to recruit for people who are directly in the target market or, or enthusiastic about games or whatever topic the game's about, and then gradually work outward from there. So once you've got these people identified, you ship them a game. And um, this has this great forcing function. Uh, you have to, at this point, <laughs> you really have to stop waffling about the decisions about your game. Because you're, you're going to be putting it in a box, and you, you're not going to fit in the box. Right? So um, you have to make a call on all, all the different rules. And uh, it's this great forcing function for, for making decisions about your game. Now, you're going to be wrong about a lot of this, obviously. Uh, but what you are doing is creating a, um, an experiment. You're like creating a hypothesis in a box, and you're going to ship it off. And that's a great uh, another forcing function for this. I mean, fear of disappointment is a powerful motivator. When, when I find myself preparing these prototypes to ship out, knowing that I'm not going to be there, I take a second look at the rules and make sure that they're clear. I take a second look at the decisions I'm making. Because um, I don't want to disappoint those people. So then uh, the people are going to receive your game, and they're going to play it and record themselves playing it. The first thing you notice when you're, when you're doing this is that all those uh, environmental factors uh, kick in. The same things that you saw, that I saw in contextual design, doing site visits, uh, kick in here, but only on, this time on video. So I watch this group. Um, and by the way, I've gotten permission from everybody on these stills. So when I, when I do play test video, I make sure to... Uh, uh, you know that that all the participants know that they their video will not be shared at all unless I get explicit written consent. So these folks graciously agreed. So they they play Pandemic Legacy season two on the floor for like twenty hours, and I thought that was really kind of different. <laughs> I asked them that recently. You know, when preparing this talk, why were you on the floor? And I got like I think a half a dozen conflicting reasons they couldn't quite even remember. Uh, they were playing in Taiwan. It was very hot. The table was too small. Uh, they were in a typhoon, or it was monsoon season, I'm not sure, and the fan was blowing, and it was blowing it off the table. Lots of different reasons, but in any case, they're on the floor for like 20 hours, which I thought was interesting. Uh, another, another example, so this is Forbidden Sky. In uh, this game, you spend 45 minutes or so trying to wire up this, this big model rocket. And if you're successful, after all this work, after, you know, after all this, this struggling, you can wire up the last wire and as this big, dramatic finish, the, the rocket lights up and makes sound, right? So I gave this uh, prototype kit. It didn't look quite this polished. Uh, I gave this prototype kit to a family in Sunnyvale and asked them to play it. And the mom took out the, uh, the tiles and put them on their shiny table. 
And then they took out the pawns and put them on the table. <clears throat> then they took out the rocket and set it on the table, and it immediately launched. <laughs> <laughs> Because the, the rocket's got these two different leads on it, and the, metal, or the table is metal, and so it, it connected the circuit. And so the, the big uh, finish was completely ruined because of this. It's something I never would have anticipated. But mostly you see the environmental stuff that you kind of forget about a lot of times when you're designing. Um, the interruptions, like pizzas coming to the door, or the kids need something, or the phone rings, or the cats walk on the table. <laughs> and the cats know where the camera is, and they really like to do this. <laughs> you have to watch that. Right. So that's the environmental stuff. Um, I think a, a bigger factor, though, is that uh, because these people are in their, they're in their own environment and they're recording you, for the most part, with their own equipment, they kind of forget that the camera's rolling. So I saw this the first time, the first ever test was for Pandemic the Cure, where I gave the set to a friend of a friend. And uh, this is Northern California. So they're playing the game and... Not too far into the game, one of the guys lights up a joint and they start passing it around the table. And I'm like, well, this is really weird. You know, I don't know these people and they're recording themselves. And this is years before legalization. But I don't know, I, honestly, I don't know what's more shocking, the fact that they did this or that I'm surprised. But, uh, <laughs> but it, it really showed me that, uh, wow, these people are really comfortable where they're at. They're not, they're not uh, self-conscious about being recorded, right? Um, and in a more day-to-day -day way, you notice this when, you know, you're, you're watching a couple playing and, and they start arguing or doing things that, you know, they, they just would not be doing when you're in the room. Uh, when you're in the room, you see all sorts of, uh, of things like you can give them the game and you can say, hey, look, I'm not going to answer your questions, all right? I'm just going to watch. But then they play the game and they're always doing this, you know. They're... <laughs> Are we, you know, which is basically, are we doing this right? You know, because they know that you're there to bail them out if uh, they screw something up or they're playing incorrectly. And it's really hard when you're sitting there, not, you know, you're twitching and you're trying not to show any emotion or try, try to show them that they're doing one thing or the other. So I, I've noticed that that goes away um, almost entirely when you're doing this remote testing method. So I ask people to record themselves, for the most part, on their own equipment. Um, laptops work great, uh, um, tablets, smartphones. And for people who don't have this kind of stuff, uh, you can get these small um, uh, video recorders. cost you about 100 bucks, and put them on a, a cheap uh, tabletop um, tripod, and you're kind of on your way. So once they've got that recorded, then uh, they need to upload it. And um, <laughs> some notes on this. Uh, don't have them record in high definition. Learn this... Uh, <laughs> Last week, first time ever, uh, 18 hours on high def uh, takes about five days to upload, so don't do that. Uh, standard definition is totally fine or even lower. Um, uploading to web services uh, works really well because it clears off your tester's hard drive and yours because this stuff really starts to add up. You can put it up on YouTube and just mark it as unlisted or um, private, and that works great. Right, so you got the video up there. So the next step, this is, this is really where you get your value. This is where you get all the payoff. You're going to watch that video and observe it and take notes. All right, so um, well, let me say, first of all, when you're, when you're watching, you really want to watch with intent. You want to try to empathize with your play testers. And um, it's, it's, um, it's something you really need to pay attention to. So I, I'm going to tell a story from Pandemic Legacy Season 1. And I've got this little spoiler warning up here. I'm going to be talking about something that is not in the game. Okay, so the spoiler is this thing is not in the game. If, <laughs> if any of you have not played the game and really would like to and don't want to be spoiled in any way, um, I can wait a second. I mean, any, anybody? I, I want to be polite here. Are we okay? All right, great. So... Um, the original pitch for Pandemic Legacy Season 1, Rob, I went back to the notes and checked it out, um, was that it was going to be the pandemic zombie game. It was going to be all about zombies taking over the world, right? That was, that was the thing. Um, zombies, right? So I'm here to emphatically tell you all that there are no zombies in Pandemic Legacy Season 1. There are no zombies in the game, all right? And the reason is from this one playtest we did. Uh, this is our lead playtest group. You might recognize some of these folks, uh, Beth Hiley up there and John Noser. Um, so Rob and I had this all set up. We planted these seeds, and there was going to be this giant reveal where the zombies spill out of the box, and, and it, was, it was all going to be mayhem, and it was going to be bad, and yeah, zombies. So anyway, 
Beth here, uh, this is a little bit, I think, either right before or right after she started reading that reveal. And I noticed something as she was reading it. Her, her shoulders kind of slumped, and she looked disappointed. And then that disappointment gradually turned into scorn. And the scorn, that kind of turned into disgust. And then the disgust turned into contempt. And then she continued to read the text, mocking it as she went forward. <laughs> I don't know if you know Beth Heilig, but this was pretty acidic. So uh, anyway, um, so this was disappointing, obviously. This is our big reveal. This is the big bang that we were building up to, and it just completely fell flat. Uh, so we ended up changing the game. Um, there are no zombies. And uh, we asked this group, actually, after... Uh, so when you're doing this method, often you can have them, people post the video as you go, and you can watch and just be a couple steps behind them. So we asked them to do kind of a post-mortem on video and just talk amongst themselves rather than doing a big Q&A session. We were like, you know, talk about the experiences you had on it, playing the game. And we, we asked them to mention this moment. And Beth talked about how uh, she felt like pandemic was science-y and uh, the zombies really kind of broke that, uh, that level of trust or at least those expectations. And so we, we modified the game to suit. So you're not always going to see such dramatic um, findings. Um, you really do have to pay attention to things. You want to be looking at, um, oh, oh, this is Beth, by the way. This is uh, Disgust. Uh, did anybody watch Inside Out, that movie of Pixar? So it turned out the, uh, the guy who consulted on this, uh, the science behind the emotions in that movie was actually the guy who wrote Emotions Revealed. I found that really uh, interesting. So anyway, um, you want to be looking for a number of things. You want to be look, you, listening, first of all, to the tone of voice that um, the players have because um, it's, it's nonstop. Uh, you can um, uh, then look, hone in on those facial expressions that I was showing you. Uh, if, if you want to learn a little bit more about that, this book is great. It's got a little quiz in it where you can take the quiz and understand your, you know, how you read faces, read the book, and then go back and take the quiz again. Um, and also pay attention to body language. Uh, you know, are people's, um, are their shoulders slumping? Are they leaning in? Because that might mean, an, it might be an indicator that they're more engaged. Or they might be leaning out, uh, which might indicate some disengagement. Um, or, you know, are their arms crossed, which might show that they're disagreeing with uh, what's going on. Or the, the worst is when they reach in their phone and they, you know, their pocket and they pull out their phone and they start operating that. At that point, they're, they're kind of checked out. But you can look at other things as well. Like, are they, are they looking at the rules? When are they referencing the rules? So you want to take all those uh, types of notes. Um, and uh, this is, these are the three main categories of notes that I typically uh, find. Uh, the bulk of them are observations. So this may be um, emotional engagement. You know, tension is high or things are falling flat uh, or, you know, people check the rules at this point. Don't be afraid to take note of fairly trivial things because if you see those trivial things show up again and again, you may notice trends and those trends may have some meaning. Uh, but, of course, you're going to be noting issues as well. And here I would really encourage you to pause the video. Um, if, you're, if you're noting anything that's, that's long or requires any kind of critical thinking, we're really bad at multitasking. You really can't write anything or do any kind of critical thinking and pay attention to what's going on in the video at the same time. So that's a good idea to pause. Uh, the issues you know, fall into the stuff that you'd imagine, bugs, um, in the, in the prototype, if there's balance issues, if players are making mistakes, or they're even making strategy errors. And the natural tendency when you're writing down these issues is to come up with solutions for them. So it's a good idea to write those down too. Um, kind of clear the cache. If you don't write down your, your ideas, they're going to keep nagging you as you're watching, and it's going to be really hard to be paying attention and trying to be empathetic as, as you're watching. So yeah, I'm terrible at bracketing, so I, I try to get those down. Even if I'm coming up with ideas that have nothing to do <laughs> with what I'm paying attention to, I'll write them down just to clear out my head. This is a sample log. This, is, this one's from Pandemic Fall of Rome. And the orange area is a, is a really important section that, I, that uh, we shared with the developer. Uh, so you can see the, the observations make up the bulk of it. I've got automatic formatting turned on here, so whenever an issue shows up, it pops up in red. The design ideas show up in green. And, you know, we can find just tons and tons of data this way. So it's difficult to, to keep track of that. Um, certainly you can't keep track of all this stuff in your head. And it's difficult on a, a paper journal to keep up. Um, and if you're going to share it with a colleague or a co-designer or developer, spreadsheets work great. Um, I'm kind of particular about this, so I, I go to the, the point where I even share time codes. Um, none of my colleagues do this because <laughs> it's just a little over the top. But 
when you do share a time code, you can, you can actually share a clip with uh, someone else and say, hey, you know, this is an important part of the video. This, this is also great because uh, for the next step, but I do want to say that this is really, really time consuming and it's really exhausting. Uh, it's super draining. So um, when you do this method, do uh, try to mix it up with other activities. If you, if you try to watch 20 hours of playtest video in a row, you're going to go, you're going to go a little crazy. Uh, but when you do it uh, and it comes time for the next step, which is iteration, a strange thing happens. You feel really energized. You can go back and find those issues and design ideas and rewrite them into a, a to-do list, a punch list. And some of these lists are like over 100 items. Um, and one of the techniques that uh, we use when we're creating these punch lists is uh, to, to reformat them. So rather than looking at a wall of this many problems or issues, which can be super demoralizing, uh, rewrite them and, and use like strong action verbs like, hey, you know, I want to fix that, I want to adjust that, I want to design that, I want to analyze that, and try to come up with punchy uh, things that you can do. And you can kind of rock, rock your way down the, the list and, and cross it out. Um, so, results. So I found that using this method and actually, you know, trying to be really in tune with the emotional journey of the, the players has really uh, helped me um, kind of get a sense of how the game truly plays. The first result you're going to find when you use this method, though, is that you're going to see far fewer usability problems um, because people are watching. and you're, it, It's like a lot of the benefits of blind testing, except um, you don't have all the, the perils of self-report. You don't really have to ask people a whole lot of questions when you're done because you've watched them experience it. Um, so a lot of great results there. I, I think that I think I want to kind of show uh, this guy though. This is Rado, uh, Richard Ham. So many of you may may have watched his videos online. So he did a video uh, recap of his Pandemic Legacy Season One experience, and I just want to play uh, a one minute um, audio clip of that. So this is Rado. Uh, kind of recounting his Pandemic Legacy Season 1 experience. So I walked in there, and, you know, and in my head, I imagined what it was like there. And I imagined, you know, the streets, you know, people terrified with the fallen running all over the place and stuff like that. And, you know, and people are like, oh, finally, you're coming to save us. You're coming to help us. And no, I went in there, I blocked it off, and I, then I discarded a card to walk back out, and I left them to die. And... And it was really hard. And it's kind of hard to think about it. And, um, you know, and Jen, you know, she appreciated, yeah, that's really, really tough. At the end of that session, though, when we're doing our bonuses, you know, I'd kind of gotten over it, and I'd kind of made my peace with, look, we have to do this. This is the way the game is designed. It's stacked against us. We have to be prepared to sacrifice, you know, the needs of the many outweigh the needs of the few. But Jen had to lock these in. And that was us saying forever, you're all going to die. And of course they did. They're fallen. They're all dead. So, yeah. So pretty powerful stuff, right? Um, so I, what I find interesting about this clip is that uh, Rado here is actually feeling all sorts of affect affective empathy for the imaginary people of this world. And I don't think we could have done anywhere, gotten anywhere near this experience if we were do, using like blind testing methods, right? Where you send out the prototype and you ask them six questions, right? So I'm gonna end with a challenge here. I got a three-part challenge for you all. The first is to intentionally design for emotion, right? Stop wandering in the desert, do this intentionally. Uh, the second is to expand your circle, right? Don't just design for yourself. Uh, sure, start with yourself, but then move that circle out and include other folks that are not like you. Design, you know, include people who are not like you. Um, the third is to try this method out. Use remote testing with video and try to proactively empathize uh, with the players as you're doing so. Right? Um, this is what I mean by designing from the inside out. Design intentionally for emotion with people who are not like you and continuously check to make sure you're on the right path. 
you're going to create better, more memorable experiences that your players can't wait to share. Thanks. <laughs>